Hello, everybody. Let's get started. It is two o'clock on the dot. I hope you had a good lunch break. If you are just joining us, welcome to the first ever Winter Wonder presented by Boston Harbor Islands National and State Park. If you're here from an earlier session, welcome back. I'm Rachel Vincent, a biological science technician with the National Park Service of the Boston Harbor Islands. This next presentation is Tracks in the Snow, an introduction to animal sign. Mammals are everywhere, but they can be secretive. While spotting a mammal is exciting, we can also learn a lot from the information they leave behind. We can use this information in the form of tracks, scat, their droppings, bones, and fur to identify mammals, interpret their behavior, and sometimes even evaluate their health. This talk will introduce you to the basics of animal tracking and allow you to identify signs of common species found on the Harbor Islands and beyond. I'd like now to introduce your presenter, Lauren Nolfel Clements, PhD, Professor and Chair of Biology at Suffolk University, Dr. No, as she's popularly known. She has been studying the mammals of the Boston Harbor Islands for more than a decade. She specializes in the population dynamics, habitat use, and movement patterns of these animals, both seasonally and annually. We encourage you to send us your questions throughout the presentation. You can type your questions into the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window or into the chat, and we'll work on answering those throughout the, throughout the presentation. If you would like closed captions on during your presentation, you can also toggle that on or off from the transcript or CC button at the bottom of your Zoom window as well. And without further ado, Dr. No, welcome to Winter Wonder. Thank you, Rachel. It's wonderful to see you and it's wonderful to be here. Um, allow me to share my screen so I can begin. All right, welcome everyone. As Rachel said, I'm very happy to be here and super excited to share with you one of the things I really love to do in the winter, which is find tracks, identify mammals, um, I believe the winter is a wonderful opportunity to do this because snow allows us to see things that we otherwise would not be aware of. Um, so to begin, I am a, a professor at Suffolk University. I do a lot of research on the Boston Harbor Islands. Um, I will provide a little bit of an overview of the research I do, just a you know, brief introduction. I'll talk a little bit about the species you will commonly see or could identify on the Harbor Islands. Um, discuss what exactly is animal sign because it's a it's kind of a term that wildlife people use that's not really in the in the common common vernacular. I'll talk a little bit about how you can um, locate sign, photograph sign. I'm going to give you examples of animal sign for the most common species you find on the Harbor Islands and also in other places like your neighborhood, sometimes in the middle of the city of Boston even. Um, and also at the end, I'm going to have a little challenge a series of challenge polls where you'll have an opportunity, ungraded of course, to um, try your, your hand at figuring out what, uh, what organisms the sign that I'm showing um, came from. Okay, so a little bit about uh, what I've been doing on the Harbor Islands. So I have been doing research on the Harbor Islands since 2008. <laughs> um, when, I, when I say that, it's just amazing to me. Um, I, my initial interest was on the introduced rabbits that used to be on Lovells Island. They've subsequently gone extinct, but that's what really got me interested in the Harbor Islands as a mammal person and someone who um, was really interested in, still am interested in introduced species. I kind of moved to small mammal monitoring um, that year as well. And then starting in 2010, I started doing on and off camera trapping on various islands to kind of get an idea of the larger species that are there as well. And what I've noticed over this period of time of working on the Harbor Islands is that it's a really intriguing system and that you have these smaller organisms, these smaller mammals that are long-term residents on the islands. Meanwhile, you have the larger species that may come and go by swimming or sometimes crossing over on the ice between islands. So this is just an overview of the islands that I have personally surveyed. So I have gotten a pretty good um, look at what, what, is, what is out there. I've done trapping, I've done some ground surveys, um, use cameras. Um, we do have also some sightings or some other islands that uh, weren't tied to either cameras or my own personal sightings. I see there is um, a question. Oh. Uh, so somebody asked, um, why did the rabbits go extinct? Well, 
it's hard to say. So I don't want to spend too long on this. <laughs> but um, from what I heard from rangers that were out there when the rabbits began disappearing, um, they, their behavior began to change. It seems as if they were either low on water or perhaps eating a plant that was changing their behavior. Um, it could have also been a hemorrhagic virus because there was a few accounts of them having seizures, but it's kind of questionable. The population wasn't was pretty high for the size island, but um, based upon my knowledge of the primary literature, Lovell's Island area-wise is about the smallest island that could maintain um, an insular rabbit population. So unless people were adding rabbits, which they were periodically, but it would have to be with a relatively high frequency to maintain the population. So it was kind of on the edge always, even though it did seem like it was pretty dense from an outside observation. I'm not progressing. Oh, there we are. Um, so I do do a little bit of small mammal trapping. Well, more than a little. I've been doing small mammal trapping on the islands for um, a number of years. So if you if you do frequent the islands, I'm having trouble with my slide here. It won't go back one. I don't know why. But um, if you see little metal boxes, um, kind of oblong metal boxes that have the word Suffolk U spray painted on them, those are mine. Just leave them alone. Don't put them on the trail. I know that they're there. We don't want the little critters inside to get warmed up. Um, I also do some camera trapping. I use a variety of different types of cameras. They are camouflaged. We try and put them in areas that are not obvious to get pictures of um, the bigger animals that are out there. And a number of the pictures that I will be using in this presentation have been taken by cameras that I've set out over the years on the islands. I don't know. So these are some examples of species that we're going to be talking about and that are commonly found on the islands. Um, you know, species that most people would probably be familiar with. So we have Eastern gray squirrels. I'll be talking a little bit about turkeys because they are megafauna and they do leave really characteristic sign. Um, these, this is a mouse. I actually got a picture of a mouse on a wildlife camera. It was running so feverishly across the frame of the camera. The camera actually took a picture of it. Um, there's raccoons on a few of the islands, coyotes, Lots of deer and deer love wildlife cameras. Anybody who has attempted to do camera trapping is probably aware that deer, I have a number of pictures of just a deer's snout right up on the camera or just its eye. They love cameras, um, as did the rabbits. So these, this is a picture down here in the lower left-hand corner of the rabbits from Lovell's Island that have gone subsequently locally extinct. They were European rabbits. They weren't um, native cottontails. Rats, of course, are on a number of the islands. They kind of come and go. Rats are very strong swimmers, so they can move between the islands. Um, skunks, some of the, sometimes there is sign of skunks on some of the inner islands and places like World's End, that's actually a peninsula, will have skunks. Mink, which are found on a number of the islands periodically. And of course, foxes. This was actually taken on Thompson Island, so these are foxes on an island. Um, I do see something in the So does anybody have any questions before I continue on? I will continue on then. Okay, so sign, what the heck is animal sign? You know, it's signs that an animal was, was there previously, was in a location previously. So these are a number of pictures that I have taken on the island. You'll notice I, in many of them, I have my trusty pocket knife there. Um, this is very important. When you're taking pictures of animal sign, even though you're looking at it and in your mind, you're judging how big it is. Later on, when you look at that picture, or if you send that picture along to someone else, it may not be obvious at which scale the picture is taken. So having something of known size in the picture really allows for easier and more um, rapid identification of species. So just give you a few. These are um, raccoon footprints. You can see they're in this uh, sandy mud here. I believe this was actually taken on Long Island. Um, this is a classic coyote print. You can see the, the shape, um, the, the presence of the nails, but just how like kind of even it is. Many times when you look at a dog print, it'll, it'll either be narrower or rounder than that. And a lot of times the nails won't be as um, prevalent unless the person hasn't trimmed their dog's nails. This of course is, a, is an unfortunate dead raccoon that apparently didn't make its complete swim. Um, here's some uh, deer, deer scat here. Um, when I say scat, I do mean droppings, as, as Rachel said. This is classic coyote droppings, coyote scat. You can see this fur here. Um, the way it, it, you know, it's, it's basically shaped like, you know, dog feces, except it has fur and sometimes large chunks of bone um, sticking out of it. 
Um, this is otter. I won't be doing extensive um, conversations about um, otters because otters are kind of ephemeral. I found this once on um, Long Island when I was visiting, but I'm not sure if this was, you know, it looks pretty old. I mean, it's totally um, just the scales and shells of the animals that the otter was eating. This is, of course, a deer leg. <laughs> I always find random things like that. And this is actually the skull of a New England uh, cottontail rabbit that they were introduced onto um, Grape Island and subsequently went extinct. That's a whole other story. And this is the top of a um, raccoon skull. Believe it or not, this is exactly what it looked like when I found it. It was just sitting there in the grass and it was obvious because it was so white against the green background. But oftentimes, if you spend enough time outside just wandering around, you will find um, these sorts of signs that animals leave behind. Um, so some helpful hints. So when you have snow on the ground, animals, much like people, are going to take the path of, path of leash resistance. So areas that have been mashed down by other animals or, the, or by people are the ways that the animals are going to be walking. Um, some of you may have noticed as we've gotten this periodic snow, um, oftentimes even things like rabbits and squirrels in um, you know, suburban and urban areas will stick to areas that humans have you know, shoveled the snow down somewhat because it's just easier to locomote through those areas. Um, some species will preferentially leave their sign right in the middle of the trail. This is especially true of canids. So coyotes, foxes will tend to leave their um, feces and urine in the middle of a trail um, or always on a trail. And that's because they're using it for communication. They want whoever's coming through to know that they're there. Um, mink and some other types of species of weasel, which I won't be covering in this talk, will tend to leave their scat on logs or rocks. So if you're walking through the forest and there's a log across the trail and you see, I'll show you what it looks like, a few pieces of small twisted scat on the log, that's probably a mink. Um, they always leave it in an area that other animals might also be passing through. But those logs and rocks can also be somewhat into the forest. They're not necessarily associated with a trail like it is for canids. Um, another thing is, when you're you're walking, you're traipsing through the forest. Sometimes you'll just see something will just catch your eye. Like you'll see a little piece of like fur or maybe a feather near the edge of the trail. Now I'm not encouraging you to traipse five miles off trail or anything like that, or even go that far off trail. But oftentimes when you find something like that, um, if you go a little ways off the trail, you may find the remains of an animal. Because if you see clumps of fur, generally wild animals don't just lose clumps of fur randomly. Um, so it's usually due to some sort of predation event that these, um, these pieces of sign will be left behind. I'll talk a little bit about identifying species by fur, but it is a little more, um, a little more challenging because it has to do with color and also consistency of fur. If you're somebody who's a fly fisher person, um, you may be good at this because you've tied flies using different types of fur, but for the average person, identifying fur is a little more of a um, challenge. Another thing is our canine companions can also help you find animal sign. Dogs, they find everything. <laughs> they find all sorts of, you know, they'll find scat, they'll find urine, which isn't much of a help. Um, they will find bones, they will find fur, um, they will even find tracks sometimes. And the best thing you can do is if your dog just happens upon something that you find interesting, praise them. This make, get your dog to associate finding, you know, one of these treasures with you being excited and happy, and then your dog will become better at it. Okay, so say you found something wonderful. I don't know if people generally consider piles of scat to be wonderful, but you know, I do. So you get excited. Oh, look what I found. You need to have something for scale. This is a problem I run into sometimes if I'm walking my dogs and I find something because sometimes I don't have a coin or you know something that's good for scale in my pocket. I try and carry a pocket knife. Um, so even a pen, anything, a key, some people will use their, their house key or their car key just so there's something of known size. So if you want to look at it later, look it up in a book, use the internet, you know, send it along to somebody who's good at identifying tracks, you need to have scale. Another thing is if you're looking at tracks, the individual tracks are important to get an idea of the foot shape of the, the animal, but also what its gait looks like matters. So different organisms will have different types of gaits. So we'll talk a little bit about um, rabbit versus squirrel prints, and really oftentimes if the snow is more than a couple inches deep, you're not going to see the paw print, but the gait of a rabbit and a squirrel do differ, and that's going to be able to help you um, identify and identify the species. Okay, so now I'm going to forge into individual species and their um, characteristic sign. So um, 
I'm just checking is if anybody has any questions, I am checking the, the Q and A box to see if there's anything. I will take questions like Rachel said throughout, throughout the talk. So, all right, I will push on then. So our first species is one of the most common on the islands that you will find sign of. Um, and since deer are usually found, not necessarily in your large groups on the island, but you know, usually in groups of a few couple animals, um, their sign is pretty obvious. They're also very large, large organisms. What I'm also gonna, what I'm gonna show you in each slide, they're all gonna have the same basic characteristics. So for each species, I'm gonna show you the skull. Um, the reason is, is the skull is the easiest bone to use to identify a species. Long bones can, get, can tell you something about the size um, and the pelvis will sometimes also be helpful, but pelvic anatomy is not as easy to learn in a short talk as is skull anatomy. So what I'll be doing is explaining the parts of the skull to kind of use as markers to look at and say, okay, if it has this characteristic, it's probably this species. I'll show you for some, most species I could find a clump of fur. Some of them I couldn't, so I'll just describe it. You know, I'll show you what the tracks look like. This is a good picture because you can see both the individual track and also the gate. Um, and of course, I'll show you some scat. And also, as a free bonus, um, I will also tell you what you can expect to smell. Now, I know this isn't for everyone, <laughs> but some people who use their sense of smell more than others, sometimes if an animal has been by relatively recently or if there's a large number of them in the area, you can actually smell them. Um, and deer are one of these species. For example, on Slate Island, there are a large number of deer and it actually during certain times of the year smells kind of like a petting zoo. Um, when you smell that out in the forest, there's probably a lot of deer around. You'll probably see a lot of these um, scat pellets here. That's when you know deer is around. Um, it looks like there's a question. Um, there's a question about Lyme disease. Yes, um, Lyme disease has been um, has has been found on the islands. People have, they, you know, it's anecdotal. There's no direct connection, but um, we know people have gotten Lyme disease when they have visited the islands. I don't know if it's from the islands. I am also in the beginnings of a study where we've been testing ticks for Lyme disease. Um, so I've been collecting ticks from the brush, but then also getting ticks off of the mice that I trap periodically. Um, and we have found Lyme disease present in those, um, in those individuals. We've also tested for other types of tick-borne diseases, but Lyme is really the, the one that we've, the only one that we've seen so far. But it is, it is present at least in the ticks and also um, probably in the mice, considering we got some of the ticks off the mice on the islands. I don't pull them off the deer. I'm not gonna, <laughs> I'm not gonna go that far. <laughs> okay, so deer. So tracks, you can see they are hooved. Um, they have this cloven hoof. Right here, you can see also they tend to walk in a relatively um, straight line. So this is a couple different, um, a few different deer kind of walking in the same general direction. Um, as far as their skull is concerned, interesting thing about deer skulls, they do not have upper incisors. So they have lower incisors, but then they have this tough um, keratinized pad on the, on the underside of their top lip that they use to pull um, up grass and other types of vegetation. Um, a tremendous number of molars in the back. There's really nothing else that you're gonna find in the Harbor Islands and in most places in Massachusetts that are similar um, to a deer um, skull in, in shape and size. So um, a notable thing about herbivores like deer is that they're missing, you know, all of the teeth that you would normally expect to see here. This space is called a diastema. We're going to see that also in rodents where they don't have um, canine teeth. They really don't have defined premolars. They just have incisors in the front and then they have the molars in the back for, um, you know, pulling things up and then grinding them um, along the backs of their mouths. Okay, it looks like I have another question. So somebody asked, do, um, do deer have uh, winter coats? So they're deer, they're a deer. <laughs> Their fur does get thicker like a lot of other species. So I probably should have, I can go back. I should spend a second on their fur um, because deer have very characteristic fur. It's very, very coarse. So sometimes when you find deer fur, you'll look at it and at first you'll say, this is almost like a really fine porcupine quill. And it'll be really light um, in some sections and really dark in other sections. So along the shaft of a deer hair is very variable and each individual hair is very thick and coarse. Um, Cause usually what you're finding is the individual hairs that have come out. But if you look at this, it has a piece of leather. It is a lot denser near the base. So they do 
um, have an undercoat. It's not as clearly defined as what we're going to see in the canids, but they do have denser fur close to their body that keeps them warm. While um, birds have down close to their body to keep them warm, mammals will have this undercoat that tends to be more, um, you know, thick, kind of a finer hair. That's almost it's it's kind of the mammalian equivalent of um, of down. You can see it really clearly here in this coyote fur. If you look near the base, how dense and kind of fuzzy looking the fur is and the guard hairs kind of stick out longer. Um, that's like a classic um, sign of a winter coat. Oh, so um, somebody asked a question about the news story um, about the deer carcasses on uh, slate and grape. Um, Rachel, I don't know if you'd like to add anything. I haven't heard anything further than that. It was a it was a mystery when it happened. Yeah. So um, the most recent reports I had heard at the end of the summer, um, and just backing up a step for those of you who don't know, there had been um, a number of um, deceased deer carcasses found um, around Grape Island. And when there was a little bit more of an investigation, there was also a couple on nearby Slate Island as well. Um, and the leading reason as of this moment is dehydration. Um, there were, the as uh, Dr. No was alluding to earlier regarding rabbits on Lovells Island. There is kind of a area population, um, uh, you know, pr prime spot for different species. Um, Grape Island is relatively small and there was a lot of deer on that island. Um, if you're from this area, you know that we had a really big drought this summer. Um, so the, the leading reason as of now is that we're pretty sure they all just, it was really, really bad dehydration. Um, and the population was too big to be able to sustain it as well. Um, unfortunately, the carcasses weren't too decom were too decomposed to be able to do full necropsies. Um, so we don't have a 100% clear answer, but that's um, currently what the scientists who are looking into it think. Thanks for the question. So yes, hopefully we'll get more rain this summer. It was extraordinarily dry last year, the, um, just as Rachel said. Um, so on to coyotes. Um, so as I said, you can see the coyote fur. Um, if you find a clump of coyote fur, it probably means something untoward happened. Um, they're not going to lose clumps of fur unless, you know, there was some sort of fight. I would look around the area, see what else, see what else you can, you can find if you find a clump of coyote fur. Um, they do have darker guard hairs, but as you can see, they have this dense undercoat that's kind of um, grayish and light. As far as what to look for, they have these, you know, it looks like a classic dog print, but they tend to be not at the most average dog print you've ever seen. So if you look at dog prints, I probably should have added some um, examples of dog prints. They tend to be narrower or much rounder. They don't tend to have this kind of very balanced, um, almost, almost square shape to them. Dogs tend to be a little more oblong or a little more roundish for the most part. Um, another major difference between coyotes and dogs is the way they walk. So you can see when you look at the track here that coyotes tend to walk in a very straight direct line. Um, for those of you who have dogs, you probably know your dog very rarely walks in a direct straight line. Coyotes, when they're locomoting, are generally trying to get from point A to point B. They're not spending a lot of time um, set marking in the middle of their territory or anything like that. They're usually just trying to get somewhere. So you'll see just a straight um, you know, really straight line. Uh, another thing is you're not going to see human footprints nearby. So that's another another kind of thing that helps helps to identify coyotes. If you go out, you know, the first thing after it snows and you see canid prints heading in a straight line and there's no human footprints to be seen, that's probably um, a coyote. As far as coyote skulls are concerned, they are somewhat similar to dogs, except one notable thing is how flat the transition is between their snout and the top of their skull. Um, dogs and wolves have a point right here called the stop where there's more of a, um, a, a, not a right angle, but a sharper angle between um, more of a, not exactly acute either, but closer to a right angle between their, their snout and the top of their skull. But otherwise it is, you know, very similar to a dog um, as far as it has, you know, the carnassial type teeth here, some premolars, the canines and the incisors. Um, this is the same scat picture. I'm apparently very proud of this coyote, <laughs> coyote scat picture, and mostly because it has all the components of coyote scat that I like to um, kind of emphasize, especially that the fur is very visible in it. 
um, when you see coyotes cats that's older, sometimes you'll just find like a, a hunk of fur stuck to the ground that's kind of in the shape of a um, of a piece of scat. That's old coyote coyote scat. What happens is the rest of the the scat kind of wears away and decomposes and just the fur is left over. So if you find little piles of fur that are in the shape of um, excrement, then you know that a coyote has been frequenting um, that area. There is another um, question here. What makes a thin straight line on the ground? Um, so that's just probably a little bit of drag. I don't know how deep this snow is here, um, but it's, it's not it's just due to the, the gait of this particular animal, maybe pulling a little bit against the ground, probably fur. Um, they don't have super furry paws, but it could just be that. Um, or it could be the tip of their tail. Um, coyotes will carry their tail very low sometimes, so it could be um, their tail. Um, there is a question about local coyotes hybridizing with wolves. Um, that, um, it, it wouldn't have happened here. So the only real known um, coyote wolf hybridization event actually occurred in Southern Canada. Um, and genetically they can trace it back to the late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, I forget the name of the national park where they did the, um, in Canada, where they did the genetic sampling to uncover that that's where hybridization occurred. But it is rare under normal conditions for coyotes and wolves to hybridize because they have very different social systems. So even though genetically they can hybridize, wolves tend to, be very territorial, very pack oriented, while coyotes tend to be more solitary um, and not as territorial. And so socially, usually wolves will attack and kill coyotes rather than mate with them. Um, how many fur samples have you found? Um, I, I find chunks of fur probably more frequently than the average person. Um, I do have three dogs and they, they do frequently find pieces of fur. Um, very, I, I haven't really found carnivore fur that wasn't attached to the full remains of an organism. Usually you don't find, like I said, um, tufts of um, carnivore fur. Sometimes you will find, say, rabbit fur or deer, um, things like that, but usually carnivores, you don't find a lot of um, their fur just around. Okay. So, um, oh, oh yeah, as far as the scent of a coyote, their urine basically smells like dog urine. It doesn't really have a really extraordinarily strong scent. Um, okay, so let's see. I was gonna move on to um, foxes, but there are a couple of questions um, about coyotes. So have I seen coyotes hunting in packs? Generally, no. So coyotes form a family unit. So what people perceive as packs is oftentimes just a mated pair and they're partially grown pups from that year. Coyotes don't remain together. So a wolf pack, um, once a wolf pack begins, you have the male and the female, and then they'll have offspring. And those offspring will often stay with them for multiple years. Sometimes wolf packs will also take on um, individual loner wolves. So they have a much larger pack size that usually ranges between five and nine, sometimes larger depending on the prey density. So usually coyotes do not hunt in packs. If you ever see them together, it's because it's a, it's a family unit um, and there should be, there's young offspring. And the males and the females don't stay together year round either. So outside of mating and pup rearing, they separate and go their own ways. Um, and then there was a question about why uh, coyote scat has fur on it. Um, that's due to predation. So they eat things um, and they're, you know, they're, they primarily are carnivores, so they will be eating things with fur. If you get really interested in coyote scat, um, you can sometimes identify the species by the bones in, in the scat um, and also the fur in the scat. Around here, usually they're eating rabbits and squirrels based upon um, what I've seen occasionally. Some of you might want to close your ears. They do eat domesticated cats too, so sometimes you can find cat bones and fur, but we're not going to we're not going to go through that in this <laughs> this presentation. But it's just due to their prey, and those things are not digestible. Mm -hmm. Fur is not really a digestible substance. Okay, so foxes. Um, foxes, another dog like. Um, you know, animal that you may you may encounter on the islands. They're a little different because they trend to be more uh, more omnivorous than do coyotes. So when you find their scat, there may be some fur in them because they will eat things like rodents, squirrels, the occasional rabbit. But oftentimes they'll be eating things like berries and plant matter. So when you find their scat, it'll be shaped similar to a dog scat, but it'll have more things like you know you can see little um, seeds in it. This has a little bit of skins of something like a. Um, cherry or something in it, um, but oftentimes there's more vegetative matter, more plant matter um, in their scat, uh, mean, 
usually um, fruits and like berries, things like that, seeds. And um, like I said, sometimes you'll find bones, but it's not as uniformly chunks of fur and, um, and bones as the coyote scat. It's also smaller, as you can see from the scale bar. So it would look like a small dog scat. The prints are also much smaller. Um, coyote, um, foxes tend to look larger because they have really dense, thick fur, as you can see from here. It's much denser than what we saw with the coyotes. Their undercoat extends a lot further out and the guard hairs, although they're still here, the, the undercoat extends further into the coat. So they look a lot puffier, um, but underneath they only weigh 10 or 12 pounds. They're not a big animal. They just are really mostly fur. Um, there's two different species that you may find on the Harbor Islands. There's red foxes and there's gray foxes. Um, they are totally different species. Um, their skulls are um, notably different, um, but their prints, their scat, um, and even the way a chunk of fur would look as far as the color would be a little different. So it'd be more grayish if it was gray fox, but they both have that really thick um, undercoat. Let me pause here because a lot of questions are, <laughs> are accruing. <laughs> Um, so somebody asked how many species live on the islands. Um, as far as mammal species are concerned, um, I, I, there's, I've, do, I've done a, a pretty good survey. Um, there's about 12 to 15 that you can find relatively commonly, but I'm sure there's others that may occasionally pass through. Um, so somebody uh, asked, what are the shapes of the, the scat for some of the animals? So, um, like I said, like when you see um, canid scat, it will be um, kind of elongate, a little bit twisted on the ends. That's pretty much a carnivore um, type scat. Things that are omnivorous, kind of like a fox, it'll kind of be elongate, but it won't be pointed. The edges will tend to be more blunt. I know you probably haven't ever had a conversation this intense about droppings, but we're going to do it. Um, things that are purely um, herbivorous will tend to make pellets like rabbits and deer. Um, so uh, the next question is about are foxes and coyotes related? They are. So um, in the carnivore lineage, um, there are dog-like things and cat-like things. Um, both coyotes and foxes are dog-like things. They're not super closely related though. They've been, they've been separated um, phylogenetically for tens of millions of years. Um, coyotes are relatively closely related to wolves, but not, not to foxes. Um, and coyotes can potentially interbreed with the wolves and, and dogs, like I said, but not foxes. Foxes are not part of the same phylogenetic group. Um, so somebody asked, are coyotes more common on the islands or foxes? It really depends upon the year. So there was a period of time there where there was a number of gray foxes on Grape Island. We were getting tons of reports about it. Um, and then it just kind of poof, disappeared and stopped. Um, there was a couple of years there where we were seeing a lot of reports of coyotes. There was a den on a few different islands um, during the late winter season. But then after they raised their pups, the coyotes disappeared. So it is very ephemeral and it's different from year to year. Um, oftentimes the coyotes don't use the same den from year to year. So <laughs> every year is, is a little different. Um, yeah, so, all right, let me continue on here. Okay, so, oh, I wanted to show you the difference between the skulls. So the bottom skull here, um, you can see they're a, a similar size, the red, the red fox skulls, uh, a little a little bigger. Um, you can see it's really super flat across the top and very, very smooth. So it's a lot flatter than what we saw in the coyote. The coyote didn't have a definite stop, but there was more of a transition here as you moved into the brain case. Um, but here, uh, the whole top line of the skull is super flat. Similar dentition, though, not different. Um, and then the, the gray fox is a little smaller. Um, the skull is a little smaller. And also it has this very characteristic ridge. And there's two of them. I should have done a top, a top picture as well. But from the top, it has these two ridges, um, these two bony ridges along the top of the skull that are really characteristic. No other species has those bony ridges atop, uh, uh, across the top of their skull like that. So if you find one of these, you look at the top, you see those bony ridges, you just know what it is. Plus with the dentition, that's you know very, very dog-like um, and the size, the whole, you know, it's not, it's not a very big, not a very big skull. A coyote skull is going to be closer to a dog size skull. This is smaller, not as small as a cat, but not as big as a dog. And once again, the footprints, the tracks, 
they're, they usually are a little less clear because they tend to have a little more fur between their toes than do coyotes. But once again, you're going to see it always in a straight line. Um, just try to get get to that next that next place without much much delay. Okay, so next we have um, raccoon. Raccoons don't have much of a scent. Um, they're omnivores, so you can see from their scat. It's somewhat similar to what we saw um, to foxes, but a little bigger. There tends to be more to it. So fox um, scat tends to be a little more compact, a little narrower, a little more dog-like. This tends to be more of a <laughs> oblong, blunt-edged log, <laughs> if you will. Tends to have lots and lots of seeds in it and tends to be kind of spread over an area rather than in a, a pile. Um, their tracks are very characteristic. You can see they don't walk on the tips of their toes as do canids, they're more plantigrade, they're flat on their feet. So you can see these are their front paws, these are their back paws, the back paws are a little larger. Um, you can see all five digits, that's another characteristic, but you can't really see their claws and their prints. Um, sometimes a little bit, but mostly you just see these really, they have really elongate digits as well. Unlike what we saw with foxes and coyotes that had the really round um, pads on their feet, these have very elongate digits. Um, and their fur, um, their fur is kind of like a deer in that it differs along the length and the coloration of it, but it's more fine than deer fur. So deer fur is almost quill-like um, and stiff when you find it, but coyote fur tends to be a little more um, fine and they do have a noticeable undercoat. Coyotes, I'm not sorry, raccoons are um, carnivores by um, evolutionary heritage. So even though they eat an omnivorous diet, they came from an ancestor that was a carnivore. So they have a very carnivore, um, you know, characteristic skull. They have the larger canine teeth. It's a lot more rounded and compact than what we saw with the canids. The canids have a much longer snout. Um, raccoons to tend to have a, a shortened snout. Um, when we look at the weasels, It'll be reminiscent of a weasel, but weasels are a lot flatter along their top line than our raccoons. And raccoons also have a relatively large skull at about four and a half inches. So oftentimes it's just about the size, very similar to what you see in the gray fox, like similar size skull, but a lot more, you can see egg shaped than what we saw with the canids, which were more um, oblong. Let's see. Yeah, so somebody asked, are they omnivores? Yes, they are. They are definitely, they are definitely omnivores. So as we know, they will eat things like crayfish, um, but they will also eat plant matter. Um, I was gonna, I was going to put um, a picture in this presentation, but I wasn't sure how people would react to it of um, a deceased raccoon that we found holding um, a salad dressing container in its paws dead. I mean, it wasn't in poor condition or anything like that, but I didn't know people would react. Um, the bottom line is raccoons can eat anything that you eat. <laughs> um, that's why they're, you know, if you know their nickname is trash panda, because they will, they can eat m the same things that humans do. That's why they can frequent things like, um, like dumpsters, because they can survive in a fully omnivorous diet with not much of a meat component even. Okay, um, so mink, mink are weasels. Um, I wasn't ironically able to find a picture of mink fur that wasn't attached to a coat, <laughs> as you probably um, have guessed. Uh, mink do have consistently um, brown fur. So the fur is brown throughout the shaft of the, um, the fur and it's, it's very, very dense, um, super dense fur, but very brown. Most other species don't have like that consistent kind of chestnutty brown color that mink do. Um, they do have um, a characteristic smell. It's kind of like a ferret. If you've ever been to, you know, a Petco or something like that, or if you have a ferret, you're familiar with that kind of musky um, smell that weasels have. Um, mink definitely have that, have that smell. You can see the typical weasel skull, much smaller than what we saw in the raccoon, but very flat along the top, but a short snout. So even though we saw the foxes had a, were flat across the top, you can see a lot of it was in their snout. Weasels are different, mink are different, and they have a very short snout, elongate brain case in the back. Um, the dentition is 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 kind of um, crowded, so their teeth are a little more crowded. They don't have um, as many premolars. They just have these carnassials, which are modified molars. Um, they're canines right here. Um, as far as their scat, quintessential carnivore scat. You can see it's very pointy on the edges. Um, it's small, so this is the equivalent of the size of a quarter here, this coin. Um, and so sometimes you'll find little bits of bone and fur in it. Um, oftentimes like the points are due to fur kind of sticking out, but there is a lot of kind of other material in it. So it will, it doesn't appear as furry 
as coyote fur, it tends to be a little more twisted um, than also what we saw in the coyotes and the foxes. As far as their prints, um, weasels tend to have a five-toed uh, print. Um, we can see here, um, you can see their little, you can always see their claws, um, unlike what we saw in the, um, the raccoon. They also have smaller digits. They're oblong, but they're smaller and there tends to be, as I said, five of them. Um, as opposed to four, which you often see in the, um, the canids. Let's see. Um, so there's a question about why do they have um, a long skull? Um, there's a number of evolutionary reasons, but one of them is that they tend to um, go into burrows of things like, say, rabbits or rodents. So their whole body is really elongate, just like, like a ferret. So they're um, adapted to going after their prey in, in burrow systems. So it just allows them to have that lower profile. Um, they tend to have shorter legs too than other carnivores um, and be thinner and that allows them to move through things like burrows. So how big is something like a mink? Um, hmm. I guess I can give it to you in feet. So probably like a foot and a half to two feet long with the tail smaller than an otter, bigger than a weasel. Weasels tend to be um, smaller. Um, and they're not as as, as uh, deep brown as something like a mink. You would know a weasel because it's smaller, um, lighter brown. Um, like they like they tend to be you know pretty small. Um, somebody asked if there were porcupines on the islands. We haven't seen them. Porcupines are very poor swimmers, <laughs> um, so the chances of them getting to an island are are um, are low. And also um, porcupines they specialize on the. Um, the cambium underneath the bark of trees. So there has to be a, a pretty good number of large trees for them to be able to sustain themselves because their diet isn't super nutritious. So there's just not a, um, a large enough food base on most of the islands for something like a, um, a porcupine, but good question. Okay, so skunk, you know what skunk smells like. Um, one thing I kind of glossed over and I forgot to mention was that um, when you smell a fox, it kind of smells like a skunk. Um, at first you may think it's a skunk, but it won't, it doesn't, I, people usually aren't as scent oriented as me, but bear with me. It doesn't linger as long. So, you know, when you smell a skunk, it, it hits you and it stays with you. Like you're like, oh, that's a skunk. And you just, you whenever you think you're through it, you're walking and it's just, it's still with you. Um, uh, when you smell a fox, it smells skunky, but also has a hint of like musky ferret in it. And it, you smell it, but it doesn't stick with you. It, you don't, you never feel like it kind of gets stuck in your nose for lack of a better way of saying it, like a skunk. Um, so skunks are primarily, they, they primarily eat plant material, but they will also um, scavenge. So if they find something dead, so if they find like say a, a dead, you know, squirrel or mouse or something like that, they will eat meat. They're not really, um, not really predators per se, but they will, like I said, eat, eat things that they found that are already dead. Um, so their scat is very rounded. Like I said, mostly contains plant material. It tends to occur in these kind of single pieces like this, not necessarily piles, like what we saw when we were looking at um, raccoons and the canids. It tends to be just like a single little piece. So you don't really find skunk scat that, that much. Um, and it's easy to miss because it's such a small, a small thing. Um, that you could pass by it very quickly without seeing it. As far as their fur, it is black and white. It's the only species that has really black and really white um, in their fur. So it's very, very um, characteristic. Um, they use it for fly tying. This is why it's in this, it's in this tube. As far as their skull, bigger than what we saw in the mink, um, but similar type shape, but not as elongate in the back. Weasel, I mean, skunks are weasels. Um, that's why they have that smell. All weasels have musk glands, but skunks have them have super powered musk glands. Um, but they all do have the ability to. They all have that that kind of smell. Um, but you can see once again, not as elongate, but still elongate. Not as defined along the back of the brain case, but similar um, weaselly dentition with the you know the kind of crowded looking carnassials and the um, the canines. Okay, so there are a few questions here. Are there weasels on the islands? I've um, found sign of mink. Um, I've I've heard reports of there being a mink. We got a picture of a mink on um, on Slate, but not of other other species of 
weasels. Um, mink can swim. They are strong swimmers, though, so they can make it between the islands. Um, why do why do skunks stink? Well, there's a lot of evolutionary reasons. They are a weasel, so they do have the scent glands, but they don't really have any other really strong predator defenses. If you've ever seen a skunk's gait, you can see it here. Um, they kind of amble along. This is it's not necessarily a straight line. They're kind of ba -ba 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 -ba. all four of the feet are showing here, so they're not matching up their feet. They're not walking with their feet straight. They're not bounding like we're going to see in squirrels and rabbits. They're just kind of walking along and they are plantigrade. Their whole foot's on the ground. Looks very hand-like. You can see all five digits. Um, but they just they just are not fast. They're not strong. They're not very wily. So their defense is the spray. That's how they've adapted to dealing with um, predators. Um, someone asked about koi dogs in the Northeast. I mean, dogs and coyotes could reproduce, but behaviorally they are so different that chances are it, it, it probably would, would not happen. I mean, coyotes are, are scared. They tend to be scared of bigger dogs and see smaller dogs as being prey. So usually behaviorally, there's just not, the, the wires are crossed. They can biologically reproduce, but the chances of it are, are rather slim. Um, also, I mean, I, I don't know that their offspring would be able to survive in the wild because they would have dog-like characteristics that would make it difficult for them to successfully hunt um, and things like that. So how big are skunks? Um, you never forget when you see a skunk, by the way. For those of you who haven't seen a skunk, the first time you see, I remember still when I was a kid, the first time I saw a skunk because there's something in your kind of like ancestral primate brain that says, black and white right next to each other like that, we should run. Badgers are also that color, so I think it's just something we have. Um, they can be pretty sizable. So skunks can be the size of a small raccoon. Um, so I'd say about the size of a cat, but lower to the ground and they move They move very different than the how, like a house cat would move. You know, house cats are kind of elegant and agile. They are not agile, they kind of waddle a little bit. They have this like very waddly gait and they are not in a hurry. So you'll know if you see, um, a skunk. I have noticed this. Some skunks have more white fur than black, um, and I have noticed it particularly here. So there are a few different subspecies of foxes, uh, not foxes, I'm sorry, skunks, um, and some individuals do have more more white fur than black. I, I'm not I, I'm not exactly sure why that is, but there's definitely a good bit of variation in the amount of black and white on skunks, but they have both. Okay, lots of questions. Thank you, everybody. Um, we're almost done with these individual species, so I can get to my poll because I know we're starting to run low on time. Um, so Nore rat, I have this one in here because as much as we hate to admit it, rats are everywhere. Um, the types of rat that we have here in Massachusetts is the Norway rat as opposed to the roof rat. So these rats are diggers. They dig um, really complex burrow systems. Um, roof rats will tend to be more of the type of rat that would be in someone's attic that would climb wires and things like that. These are more of the, the ground um, rats, these are the bigger ones. This is the same species that they use for laboratory experimentation, the Norway rat. Um, so if you've ever smelled a rat, you know the smell. Rats have a very oily, dusty smell. Um, it's very characteristic. Once you smell it once, you know it. Um, it's a very uh, thick smell. Rats tend to be, they have relatively oily fur um, and they tend to use the same entrance to their burrows all the time. Um, so they can sometimes leave an oily residue in the area that can be, that can be smelled. Um, this is an example of a rat burrow. I took this picture on Pedix. There was a year where there were rats in one part of the island that I wasn't expecting, but you can see where they are. They leave these noticeable openings um, and you can see multiple ones and they leave the openings pretty, pretty clear so they can get in and out of their, their, um, their burrow system quickly. Um, so sometimes they, they, they will be hidden a little bit under something like a shrub, but this area was relatively open so I could see the openings um, to their burrows. You can see they have their characteristic five toes, very, very small. Rats are not, are not generally super large, despite what people may think. These are their back feet, these are their front feet. So as we transition to talking about squirrels and rabbits, you'll see that they have a similar gait where their front feet actually occur behind their back feet. They bring their back feet in front of their front feet while they're locomoting. Um, their scout is very char characteristic, very oblong, small pellets. Um, and their skulls, typical rodent skull, large incisors and then in the back they have the the flat molars but this diastema space much like what we saw with the deer where there's no canines or premolars or anything like that there's a question 
are the omnivores? Yes. Much like what we saw with um, uh, the raccoons, uh, they can eat anything that you eat. They can survive purely on plant matter, though. That's not a problem for rodents, but rats are opportunistic, so they can survive on a, on a variety of different, um, different foods. Um, so this one, I didn't want to go too deep into it, but squirrel and rabbit are notoriously difficult to tell apart on the snow. Um, it's something that I, I myself struggle with. Is it a rabbit or a squirrel? A rabbit or a squirrel? Um, so I just wanted to show you this because these are two relatively common species that you may find tracks, the tracks of. Um, this is about the same depth of snow. If the snow was a little um, less deep, so the snow like you know we've gotten recently that's like an inch or less, um, what you would see is squirrels, you can always see the toes if the snow is not too deep. Rabbits, you can't really see the toes because they have very, very furry back and front feet. Um, so you, you never see the pads of their feet, you just kind of see the shapes. But with squirrels in really shallow snow, you will see the toes. If you can see the toes on the print, it's a squirrel. Um, but if the snow is deeper or you can't see the toes, what you need to look for is when rabbits locomote, if, unless they're running, um, what they will do is they'll put their front feet, they won't align them. They'll put one in front of the other and these are their back feet. So they'll put their feet down like this and then they'll bring their back feet forward to move. Squirrels will hold their, their front feet together as they, as they locomote. Um, and also the generalized shape of the track you can see is kind of squarish as opposed to this being oblong, but really this um, kind of staggering of the front paws is the, the big difference between these, between these two. Um, but they are, they're, they're one of the more challenging ones because it is of a similar size, the entirety of the track is about a foot uh, long if you include all the feet together. Um, and you know, they're two of the most common um, species that you'll see around. Let's see, here's a question. Um, so someone was asking, what do they eat? They have big front teeth. I'm assuming this is um, from the, the rat. Um, so generally, um, rodents have those very large front teeth that are ever growing, and it's because they are gnawing animals. So they gnaw on things. So they gnaw on wood. They, you know, they gnaw through substances to make their burrow system. Something like a squirrel uses its gnawing teeth to bite through the um, tough outer, sh you know, shell of nuts. So they do have a requirement to gnaw on things. Rabbits have a similar tooth morphology that they have these really long, ever growing um, incisors, but it's for gnawing through tough plant material, wood, stuff like that. Okay, um, so I just included turkey in here because there's so many turkeys <laughs> on the islands. Um, birds do not use scent to communicate so they don't have a smell. Um, there's, all, there's that, you know, it's not really a legend or anything, it's the truth that one of the main predators of skunks is actually great horned owls because they can't smell them. So they can get sprayed by a skunk and it doesn't bother them. Most birds, um, notably not vultures, but most birds have a poor sense of smell. They tend to not use scent for communication purposes like mammals do. Most mammals use scent for communication. Um, they have, you know, they have this this um, scat that looks kind of mammalian-like, except you can tell it's a bird by it has this whitish um, uric acid right here, which is actually, they don't make a liquid urine, they excrete this uric acid um, instead um, to release their nitrogenous waste. These are their tracks, you know, typical dinosaur. <laughs> they are dinosaur, dinosaur tracks um, through the snow. And there's a variety of different types of feathers um, that they will have. And their skull, of course, very bird-like, but sizable. The biggest bird skull you're probably gonna find at about four inches. Um, so similar to what we saw in something like a skunk size skull. Okay, um, and other ways you can you can see bird sign in the snow. So you may see something that looks like this or like this. Um, these are the edges of the feathers of a bird. This is a crow that was flying really low against the snow. That totally rhymed, I didn't mean for that to happen. Um, but this is the tips of their wings and the bottom of their tail um, dragging against the snow. Uh, bird feet generally have that similar shape to what we saw on the turkeys with the toes, the three toes. Um, and this is actually an owl um, that came down. Um, I was trying to grab this, this prey item here, which looks like it was probably a rabbit running through the snow. Um, and of course, then there's also owl pellets, which instead of um, excreting the bones and the hair through their feces as a coyote does, um, owls and other large predatory birds actually regurgitate these little balls that are filled with hair um, and bones of their prey items. So those are other things that you may find that are signs of um, birds. Um, so somebody asked how many squirrel species on the islands? Only eastern gray squirrels. There are no other, there are no chipmunks and there are no red squirrels. Um, so somebody asked if turkeys are related to chickens. Um, actually not very closely. Um, so the turkeys are a new world species. So they evolved in 
um, North America as opposed to chickens, which are an, an old world species that evolved in um, Eurasia and Africa. So um, totally different lineage. Um, so they've been separated for a long evolutionary time, which is funny because people usually associate them with each other. Okay, so now I have my poles. So um, I, here we are, this is the first, the first pole. So look at this, this fun sign here. So let's see. So 35% of people have voted. I don't know how long I should wait. <laughs> I was just going to say, it looks like it's still going up a bit. I'll let it go for another <laughs> couple seconds, but I'm going to close it in just a sec. I know I'm so close to the end. There's been so many more questions that I anticipated. I wouldn't have done so many species if I knew. <laughs> All right, closing this poll. Let's see. All right. I'm going to. So people did wonderfully. Um, so I actually chose this is this is a, um, a possum. So a possum is an omnivore, much like what we saw with raccoons. So it is an omnivore. You can tell by its log like shape here. Um, it's typical sort of omnivore or carnivore. Um, scat. So excellent job, everyone. Um, so this is actually the, the print from from the title of my talk. So um, there's a poll associated with this um, too. Sorry, click the wrong button. Should be the right one up now. <laughs> oh yeah, they're going. All right, you're answering much faster this time. We'll give it another yeah, couple shocked. seconds. <laughs> I'm telling you, scat is scat is hard. I mean, it's it's also an odd thing because, you know, people are. When I started looking at scat, I was a little bit reticent as well. <laughs> but 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 you know, prints are a little more. They're an easier sell. Let's just put it that way. All right. Um, so wonderful. This is actually a fisher. Um, I, I found this in my neighborhood. I was totally not expecting this. I ended up being a crazy person who ran up some, per this is in somebody's yard. I ran into their yard and took a picture of it because I didn't expect to see a Fisher print um, in this area. Okay. Um, so this is a little different of a poll. Um, so this is a matching. <laughs> so match the, the print to the, the poop. <laughs> so you can see they're labeled A, B. You can even use your finger for scale, as you can see in a pinch. Um, <laughs> if, if all else fails, you always have your finger. <laughs> Human hands are within the same, you know, similar size range. You're all doing great. I'm gonna leave it open for another few seconds while the couple more responses come in. All right, it looks like it's plateauing. Let's oh, yeah. See. Yeah, yeah, and great job, everyone. Yes, this is totally a deer. That's some deer scat. This was supposed to be a trick. This is actually muskrat, which is similar to what we saw in the Norway rat, but it's also a pellet, but it's more elongated. So great job. Deer is more rounded. Um, and this is, is otter, <laughs> randomly. Um, okay, one more poll, and then I'm definitely wrapping it up. Um, so um, this question is it's about smell so we put a <laughs> putting some tricky ones in here all right but people are answering like crazy so i'll leave this open for another few seconds you all are doing a great job yes I mean, yeah, this is wonderful. I'm so glad people are engaged answering. Oh, great. All right, another few seconds. It looks like numbers are still going up a bit. All right. Yeah, that's good. 
So you, you guys got it by a nose. It is um, a coyote. You can tell by the extensive fur here and the, and the kind of twist in it. Um, it doesn't have a scale bar. Um, there's also this weird clump of grass because coyotes like dogs sometimes will just eat grass um, randomly. But th the amount of fur in this is definitely um, a coyote. Anyway, I am going to um, wrap it up. I want to thank everyone. This was wonderful. The level of engagement was amazing. Um, and I want to thank everyone involved for um, giving me this opportunity. I had a wonderful time and it was, it was great. So thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. No, for the wonderful presentation. And thank you all for attending and being engaged and asking such fantastic questions. Um, we're going to take just a couple minutes. I know it's three o'clock now, but we do want to take a real quick bio break. Our next presentation is Birds of Prey Live, and that will be starting in just a couple minutes. So we hope to see you back in just a little bit. Thanks so much.